Good afternoon. We're going to start in a minute or two. Um, my name is Todd Zimmerman. I'll be your host for this afternoon's extravaganza. Um, there are still some seats available up in the front. They're going fast. <laughs> the, uh, uh, for those of you who are seeking uh, continuing education credits, this session has been approved for one and a quarter AIA and one and a quarter AICP continuing education credits. Uh, and if you uh, desire a credit, there's a sign-up sheet in the back of the room. And uh, I'm asked to remind you to write your names and AIA numbers clearly. For AICP attendees, uh, you can report your attendance online at planning.org slash CM. And, uh, you can search event 19209 for a list of all sessions and tours from CNU 20. Again, my name is Todd Zimmerman. I'm one of the managing directors of Zimmerman Volk Associates. We do housing market analysis for urban and new urban communities. have done uh, several hundred across the country. This session, for those of you who uh, might be in the wrong room, this is the session entitled Time is on Our Side. And the learning objectives are posted in front of you and they're probably also posted on the AIA and AICP websites. We are going to do uh, a presentation that has uh, several formal presentations and then a period of time when uh, the three panelists are going to uh, have crosstalk, argument, uh, complaints, and um, if we're very lucky, maybe even a fist fight, and then we will open it up to you to join in the fun. The topic of time is one that I've been fascinated with for uh, as long as we've been involved in this new re recovered art of placemaking. And uh, the way the session is organized, I'm going to discuss uh, the power of time, giving, considering uh, harnessing, compressing, activating the power of time on real estate assets. Um, then David Coffey, uh, an, uh, uh, an attorney who is based in Gainesville, actually in Hale Village Center that many of you in the room know about, is going to describe the impact of time, harnessing time, on a, a newly created place, namely Hale Village Center. And then finally, Barry Alberts, who is uh, the managing partner of City Visions Associates in Louisville, Kentucky, is going to discuss the impact of time on the, the development, redevelopment, and enhancement of an existing urban place, in this case, uh, downtown Louisville. Then we will have a panel discussion, and then we will open it up for your consideration. Uh, t uh, it was uh, Rabelais who said, time ripens all things. When I, when I knew that Barry was going to be on this, panel with me. I couldn't help but put a uh, photograph of a Rick house uh, where they take a uh, white dog and pour it into uh, virgin white oak charred barrels and as if by magic eight years later wonderful bourbon comes out. Uh, that's actually a relatively simple linear process compared to the analog of time in real estate which is an extremely complex system and real estate has over the past uh, 50 or 60 years uh, become codified to an extent that the complexity that happens in great urban places is increasingly difficult to get when each asset type has its own rules that don't intersect with its, with its neighbors. Uh, this is an image that most of you know. This is a, a place that we have celebrated again and again. Um, this is the first street, Tupelo Street at Seaside, the Ernesto Bush's uh, uh, iconic uh, beach pavilion. But if we turn back the clock on this, we know the, the brick sidewalks, the 
the tin roofs and uh, the, the uh, picket fences, the, the, the trees. Uh, if we turn back the clock to the very beginning, the same scene was very different. And all of the, all of the enhancements, all of the characteristics that we think of uh, when we see, when we walk through a street in, in Seaside, some of them, the pavers, for example, were never contemplated until rich people appeared with their Mercedes and BMWs and complained about the dust. Um, the, the iconic tin roofs, you see this, this house uh, here has shakes, not tin. It, they have, it has tin now, uh, but it didn't then. Uh, the galvalume, the standing seam, this is, this is corrugated steel. Uh, very different. This is, I, I, and, and many of my colleagues divide the placemaking into the vernacular, which uh, is like, very much like planting a garden, laying the path, putting the perennials in, putting some self-seeding annuals in, and, 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 and letting nature take its course. In a way, that's the way uh, organic places grew when we had the luxury of time, when we could take a, a settlement at a dusty crossroads or at a, at a river ford and, uh, and add uh, human commerce uh, and a little bit of economic activity and just wait 200 years. It's a mix of the vernacular and the classical. The classical, this is a, obviously an iconic American place, Mr. Jefferson's Academical Village in Charlottesville. The classical pre pre presents the immutable framework around which economic activity can grow but can set a consistent framework. And so the, our feeling is that balancing both vernacular and classical gets you the best of both worlds. The, uh, I'm going to take you overseas now to uh, a place that I love, uh, Dijon, France, not just for the, for the Burgundy wine, but for the food and uh, the history. This is a, uh, you probably can't see, yeah, maybe you can, I don't, from my angle I can't see it, but this is a postcard from uh, I think 110 years ago of this same scene in the Place de la Liberation. These images will probably be stronger. Um, the, the colonnade and the Ducal Palace, which you cannot see here, is the, cla the immutable classic, classical framework. Uh, the buildings and pathways, streets, that have grown up around the colonnade uh, are the vernacular response. 20 years ago, it was a parking lot. 100 years ago, it was a place where carriages lined up. And the, again, the, the consistent spot is the colonnade that Mansart, the, the great uh, uh, 17th century architect, uh, was created on behalf of the, uh, the Duke de Bourgogne to frame the great ducal palace. So everything that you saw was built up against this, this colonnade. The, the immutable classical uh, framework and uh, letting nature in this case, nature as man and the economy taking its course. So the value of time is, has been summarized uh, very well by Christopher Alexander uh, eons ago now in his, uh, in his book, uh, A New Theory of Urban Design, that talked about uh, the organic, trying to harness the organic mechanism of, of urbanism and that each element that's put into place uh, reacts to that which, which came before, and over time you develop a synergy between uses. There's also the issue of successional development, and I, I, you should consider, you've been here for several days, you can, should consider the difference in character and economic potential and economic potential dynamism between walking on Clematis Street, which is clearly uh, laying the garden path and letting nature take its course, and city place, which is uh, landed in place, complete, uh, with no potential for successional development. Perhaps the buildings themselves can learn, but 
the framework, although far from classical, is set in place. Economic development, if we actually use that term not as jargon, but uh, using the English language, it's the, it's the notion of, of development, development uh, of, of economic, uh, the economy developing over time. Uh, and that's the, the synergy and the succession and the growth and the change that, that occurs over time. The problem of time is that uh, we're in a, in a time uh, <laughs> where time is money. And we're coming out of a period where everything was analyzed by the uh, present value, the, uh, uh, the alternative uh, uses of capital, the, the discounted cash flow analysis. The other problem of time that has absolutely nothing to do with financing structure is that left to their own devices, things fall apart. Uh, entropy, the, uh, the issue of maintenance, um, that there are things that uh, we, we divide. When we do our housing analysis, one of the great divides we do between households is those who, who love the gloss of the new and those who prefer the patina of age. Uh, a good place offers, offers both of those things. Um, so that's the, the framework in which I've asked these t two gentlemen to set their comments and describing the history of their uh, two communities. The so following me now will be David Coffey, who is a land use attorney, developer, and former elected official. He's a founding member of this organization, the Congress for the New Urbanism. He's a sole practitioner with over 30 years of experience with land use zoning and development in Florida. He co-wrote the state's model land development code and has helped many Florida governments write unified land development codes. He served as the mayor of Gainesville and as an elected city commissioner for a couple of terms. He's an equity partner in a number of real estate projects and maintains a law practice focused on real estate development. Um, he lives and works in Hale Village Center, the, the project that he's going to discuss. And his experience in <laughs> academia and in, in municipal government and as a developer's advocate, uh, he's given a, he has a, 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 an, an intriguing, well-rounded perspective on the forces that shape real estate. So please join me in welcoming David Coffey. Sorry, that was anticlimactic. We didn't have our, <laughs> our act together here. You get to see the behind the scenes. Thank you, Todd. Uh, can you all hear me in the back? I was in the last session. I had great difficulty hearing all the way in the back, so I wanted to be sure that you could hear me. Um, as Todd just indicated, I, part of my background is as an elected official and also as a, uh, I'm an attorney. And I've been given 15 minutes to make a presentation, which is, one of the, is an incredibly challenging task for a former politician and an elected official. Uh, so I'll be speaking uh, as quickly as I, I possibly can while conveying the information. Uh, my presentation is to share with you uh, the story of Hale Village Center as best I can. Um, it is definitely not what has occurred uh, right next door to us here with City Place. It is not an example of a development uh, that was master planned and implemented in a very short time frame. Instead, it's one that has uh, a very lengthy history and really the entire history revolves around an incredible man who was recognized here uh, on Wednesday night with the award of the John Nolan Award uh, given to him by the Florida CNU. Uh, his name is Robert Kramer. Uh, he's an architect and um, you know, incredibly uh, wise individual who was practicing 
architecture in Miami and uh, was dissatisfied with what he was doing and had in mind instead uh, building a traditional town. He was fascinated by New England traditional towns. And so he traveled around Florida and looked around for a, a good site to create a traditional town and settled in an area that is just west of Gainesville. It's actually outside the city limits of Gainesville. And what you're seeing here is the property that he was able to acquire with uh, co-investors and ultimately develop. It's 1,700 acres of land uh, that previously had been a plantation, and that's the, the reason for the name, Hill Plantation. Um, and today it's uh, virtually built out, has uh, 2,686 residential units uh, and 480,000 square feet of non-residential use. And it took him about 15 years to develop uh, the area that you see more or less inside the purple circle. I don't know how clearly you're able to see any of that. Uh, it doesn't look real clear from this angle, but inside this circle here is where the village center is today. But for over 15 years, he was developing everything around it, and it's you know fairly suburban, um, albeit all of the areas that he was able to retain control over are very unique. Uh, some of the best suburban, uh, very suburban, suburban development that you'll find anywhere. Uh, he was very much influenced by uh, Ian McCard and wanting to design with nature. But he first got it approved in 1979, the first year that Florida had its DRI law, Developments of Regional Impact, and had to go through an incredible process in order to get that approved. And uh, the community was not at all receptive to the idea of there being non-residential uses anywhere, uh, anywhere in, the, in the general area. And so as a result, the approval required that the non-residential uses essentially be hidden. They must be internal to the development and not designed to, be, uh, to serve anybody outside of the development. Uh, and that plays a big part in the uh, viability, ultimately, of the project. So for over 15 years, his job was developing the entire uh, suburban community which would then, as he would tell me, give him the ability and the credibility to develop the town center that he always envisioned and wrote about in 1979 when seeking the development of regional impact uh, approvals. I'm going to go past that. And this, this image right here is of the uh, plantation house. It's, uh, this was a plantation, a cotton plantation. and. The fact that it was a plantation does, in fact, make it quite controversial uh, for many in the African-American community in Gainesville. Uh, there's resentment that there's a place still called Hale Plantation. Uh, but that structure has been fully restored now, and it's quite beautiful, uh, something to look at. But throughout the, that first 15-year period, um, everyone knew of Hale Plantation as this incredibly low-density sort of rural community uh, emphasized in the very early years horseback riding and uh, this is uh, Bob's wife Shirley and David who were here on Wednesday evening to receive the John Nolan Award uh, on behalf of uh, Bob Kramer which if you all are not aware of he passed away last August I wanted to include this. This is straight out of the uh, documents that were submitted to uh, the state of Florida in 1979. Uh, and this was for the uh, submittal for the DRI. And I won't read you the whole thing, but essentially what he's saying right here is that we intend to develop a place where it's possible for people to walk and, and uh, take care of their daily needs. This was before, I must say, uh, seaside. So it, the very first building that was built in the village center, uh, I don't know if you can see it clearly enough, but it was reflective of that um, plantation house that I showed you earlier. 
And this building is on the southernmost edge of the village center, and for many years it was the um, sales office for Hale Plantation. And this street right here was just a, a dirt uh, or gravel area that you would pull into and go look at uh, uh, the, what the sales center had to show you. No one could imagine that it was the very first building of a village center that would take on an urban form. But Bob Kramer had that vision, and it became fairly well known fairly early, and amazing people would come and visit, like Leon Creer, uh, and would see what was on the ground at the time and give suggestions. And over here on the left is one of the master plans that Bob worked on for many years. And as he would get thoughtful input from folks like Leon Creer, he would make adjustments over time. Uh, and so that, that plan that you see there is not exactly what ultimately was built because he kept uh, adjusting it. And the manner in which he went about literally developing was uh, in, in phases. Um, unfortunately, I don't have aerial photographs that allow me to show you literally how it went in phases, but essentially it was this. Down here is where that uh, first building is that I showed you. Uh, and this was phase one here in this area, which is all mixed use. And then up in this area here is mostly single family residential. And he developed those areas first. And then a, a second phase sort of filled in this area here and took the uh, main street north to the northernmost end. And then a third and final phase is what you're actually seeing happening on the ground right there, all the horizontal improvements had just gone in here for the third phase. And one of the techniques that he used to prevent the public from becoming over alarmed by the fact that it being an urban space, there were not going to be very many trees retained uh, that were on the site before. He would put in the horizontal improvements but leave all the trees as much as he could in areas where he was going to be putting buildings later once he found a suitable buyer for the site to build the buildings. Uh, and it, it really did make a big difference. Uh, no one screamed about uh, the tree removal because they didn't really perceive it. Uh, the, another thing, though, that he did was you, you, you can see here he, he put in the street trees right away. He, he literally bought a, uh, a nursery with a, a tremendous inventory of large live oaks and began planting them as quickly as he could, knowing that it would take a long time before they would begin to mature. Now, this is the plan that shows the uh, mixed use areas running all the way to the northern end, uh, the single family, uh, and then the uh, town, large lot, large lot, the larger homes on pretty small lots. The typical lots are, they begin at 18 foot widths uh, I actually live on what we called an estate lot. It's 35 feet wide by 85 feet deep. Um, and this is just uh, an example of, of a building that Bob managed to find someone who was willing to do a mixed-use building. And ground floor is uh, office, second floor is two apartments. And you can see just beyond it how there's open space yet to be developed. Um, one of the key components was the postal center, and it was first, as you see it right here, uh, in the early years. Uh, it then moves uh, further north. That building right there is immediately adjacent to the first one I showed you. Um, and another thing that he did, too, though, was to retain any large trees that made sense to try to save, and those would be the large live oaks. And what you're seeing here is something that the landscape architects all told them would fail because there's nothing but Im impervious surface around those uh, oaks, but they're uh, doing fine today, and that would be about 17 years later. Uh, here's an example of the residential area where he put in the street trees, as I mentioned earlier. This is fairly soon after the trees had gone in, uh, and he put in, as you can see here, uh, brick sidewalks throughout the community uh, because he knew that those trees and their roots are going to start moving that sidewalk. And the bricks, they're just laying on gravel, essentially. And when it's necessary, you just peel them back, 
cut away whatever is causing the problem, and then lay them back down again. And it's, it's a, a technique that has worked incredibly well. The trees ultimately begin to really provide serious canopy and make it impossible to grow grass. You, you notice in the previous slide, there was grass. It's virtually all gone today. There are a few areas where it remains, but it's virtually all gone. Um, and um, so you'll, you'll see a transition over a period of years, and it's actually surprisingly fast. Um, uh, I don't know if you're all, are you all able to see that? Is that bright enough? You can see it, okay. It's just the angle that I'm looking at, okay. Uh, this is a unique uh, structure there, and there it is today. I went around and took pictures just a couple of days ago. And when you do that, you go around and take the pictures like I did, you realize two things. Uh, one, what an amazing place this is, but secondly, how incredibly important it is for those trees to have developed and create the canopy that it has. Because without it, it would not be, for all its beauty, it would not be a walkable community in north central Florida because it just gets unbearably hot. And with the canopy that has developed, it's actually quite comfortable. In order to help stretch the development north, he would do things like this. this he put in the horizontal improvements, which you see all around here, uh, and then would put something like that there in order to help people begin to see that something is about to happen up here. Uh, visitors would come like this. This is Andreas Duani visiting, and he was quite disgusted with the size of that uh, sewer, uh, stormwater inlet and uh, demonstrated his, uh, how bad it was. But you can see he managed to get a um, doctor's practice to purchase the property right here and build uh, office and then their residences above. Uh, over time, others got the idea and began to buy more, and it eventually evolves to what you see here. These are residences, a large office over here. And if you go down the residential street and look back, this is what it looks like today. And looking the other way, this is what it looks like today. And uh, you can see the impact that the trees have had. Uh, this right here, this is a close in the single family area. Right there, what looks like single family homes, that's actually a triplex uh, adjacent to single family homes on the close. And then if you go back to the southern end again, and just I'll take you up the, this street here very quickly. Uh, this is uh, the first building that I showed you early on. That's actually my office, uh, which I now own. And you have mixed use all along both sides, residential on every single uh, second floor that you see. Uh, this was the third place, which is, uh, there's a picture of it in the brochure for the CNU. Um, this right here, just a quick side note, was a driveway required by code. But as soon as the uh, inspectors left, uh, the driveway was cut out and uh, the edge enhanced. The post office that I showed you early on later moved here, further north. As the community grew, he would move the post office and the market, and it became the market as well. Uh, but then both, again, moved later. Uh, one other uh, consequence of the trees is the way it moves the streets as well, and it's, it's a major issue uh, that we are aware of, not yet sure how to deal with. And you see how it, it humps up the sidewalks. That's about a foot and a half rise right there. Uh, but someone can fairly easily remedy that uh, situation. Uh, yes. Yeah, I'm moving through it fairly quickly. Um, <laughs> the uh, townhomes, let me just back up. There are the townhomes uh, right after they were developed and then fairly soon thereafter. I mean, it is amazing how quickly it happens that the trees grow large enough to where they begin to block the buildings. And we did have to go through a period of years where it was very, very difficult to see the buildings because of the trees would be at this stage. But eventually, if you keep pushing them up, and that's what we've been doing, pushing the crown up, eventually they'll get high enough and you begin to really see the buildings again like you're able to uh, here. And this is just another example of the mixed-use buildings um, with ground floor uh, office and uh, two levels of residential uh, above. 
I put this slide in because uh, if you go visit the Village Center today, you'll see that it's virtually built out, but there are still a few things remaining to be done. Uh, and this is one example of uh, one of the larger homes being built. Uh, and it's all under the control now of the Owners Association. Uh, the developer has long since turned it over. And the Owners Association members have no background in architecture, no real appreciation for the importance of details. And I don't know if you can see it, but these windows here have no muntins, ex external expressed muntins, as you architects uh, describe it. And uh, the average citizen you know, has no idea why that might be important, but this is the first example of any residential anywhere in the development uh, that did not have it. Uh, with, under Bob's guidance, uh, there was you know, a keen appreciation for the importance of that kind of detail. And it, it's sort of an ominous question mark for all of us as to you know, how well will the uh, qualities be retained. This, uh, for those of you who are not aware of it, I doubt there's anyone not aware of it. Uh, Gainesville is the home of, uh, it's home of the University of Florida where Tim Tebow played. Uh, this actually was just to remind me to mention in closing that um, Hale Village has had a huge impact on public policy in our region. Uh, when you advocate mixed-use urbanism, in the abstract, it's very difficult for people to accept. But if you can take them to a place that's really exceptional in its quality and show it to them, they always, I've had no, no one say, no, we don't want that anywhere near us. They always embrace it. And it's now been embraced so much in Alachua County and in Gainesville, where what was once the most difficult in terms of, of regulatory approvals form of development mixed-use urbanism. It is today clearly the preferred, and in some areas, the required. And so today, uh, we're seeing a tremendous amount of interest and in development in mixed-use urban um, transit-based, and that's the reason for the, the bus vehicle uh, development. And so much of it is, I think, directly attributable uh, to the path that uh, Bob Kramer has blazed with Hale Village Center, and just to give you a sense of time, it has taken about 30 years from the beginning to reach the point where we are today, 15 of those years uh, being uh, the years during which the Village Center itself was evolving. Uh, during the question and answer session, I hope I'll have a chance to share with you how we actually uh, managed to uh, accomplish all of that. Thank you. Thank you, David. Our next speaker is Barry Alberts, who is uh, a managing partner with City Visions Associates based in Louisville, Kentucky. It's a firm that specializes, let's see if I can multitask here, uh, a firm that specializes in the creation of innovative mixed-use private developments designed in collaboration with the public sector with the goal of enhancing uh, the public realm. Firm's project range from the development of the multi-phase glassworks district, which you will see in downtown Louisville, the redevelopment of a 19th century sanatorium in Buffalo, the downtown waterfront and art districts and connectivity program in Paducah, Kentucky. In addition to its development projects, City Visions provides a range of real estate development, urban design, and financing assessments and strategies for both public and private entities, focusing wherever possible on the creation of collaborative uh, public-private partnerships. Uh, I asked Barry to talk because of his history. His, uh, prior to the establishment of City Visions, Barry was the executive director of the Downtown Development Corporation in, in Louisville, which is the uh, entity that was responsible for downtown's long-term economic health and vitality. Uh, from 1988 through 98, Barry created and served as the executive director of the Louisville Development Authority. And in Louisville, Barry created the innovative downtown housing fund, uh, which we uh, uh, tout all across the country, wrote the Louisville Downtown Development Plan, created the West uh, Main Street uh, Streetscape Program, directed the redesign of downtown's urban spaces, parks, and plazas, and created the Louisville 
Community Development Bank. Uh, please welcome Barry Alberts. <clears throat> Thank you, Todd. I'm going to uh, talk about uh, essentially a 20-year process from the time I first got to Louisville to the present time, first uh, 15 years or so. I can't get my little uh, clock to work, so I guess you have to tell me when I'm, when I'm, uh... oh, there you go. Okay, the first uh, 15 years or so, as Todd mentioned, I was, uh, I, I oversaw the downtown development program for the city in the last five years. Uh, I've been working uh, in Louisville on the private sector side, so we have a good, good sort of sense, good mix of uh, of how time uh, has is helpful and how time is is often a challenge in these things. And during that period of time, there's been a lot of development in downtown Louisville. Uh, much of this development, uh, or all of the development, is uh, advancing what we hoped would happen in terms of recreating a dynamic and an urban environment that uh, had struggled uh, certainly in, in past decades. Uh, not all of these things were things that were anticipated. Uh, uh, many have public-private components, but uh, uh, some things occurred uh, uh, many, many years after we initially started the program, and that was actually designed in. We realized that to be sustainable, now using that word a little bit differently than most of us uh, may hear about it now, uh, we had to understand that things change over time, marketplaces change, people's, people's uh, attitudes change, uh, people's desires change, people's households change, and uh, to uh, not just chase the latest fad in the world of development or planning, we had to, to build a strong downtown that could accommodate that and actually use that as, a, as an advantage. Uh, how did we do that? Uh, so I'm, I'm, uh, I've listed here a number of strategies, and I'm going to touch briefly on each of these. Uh, but in the interest of time, just briefly mention them, and then anybody who wants to talk more specifically about any of them during the uh, during the Q and A, we'll be happy to do that. Uh, the first one really deals with principles. We we uh, believe that it's important to stay true to your principles, and uh, our downtown development plan, for example, uh, is not a prescriptive land use plan. It is a principles-driven plan that lists a number of fairly uh, innocuous, I guess, or fairly generic principles uh, that are, to an extent, timeless, that gives us the ability to review projects, review initiatives, based on whether or not they meet these guidelines, these, these principles. Uh, it was interesting listening to Peter Calthorpe's presentation this morning, because he was talking about a set of design principles for, for China, and uh, they weren't all that different than for Louisville or New York or San Francisco or Paducah or any place else. Uh, these, these do have a sense of, of importance to urban areas, and they're important today, they're important next year, they're important 10 years from now. And if you have a mechanism that says, that allows you to screen uh, certain activities, whether they're public or private, against these principles, then uh, you'll always come back to the center. You'll always come back to the things that continue to make the city strong, strong places. The second thing that we had not done very well in Louisville is to build on our existing and those uh, unique assets that we have. Uh, most cities, uh, I, should have, I should have waited for that slide. Most cities, mid-sized cities particularly, uh, lo uh, like Louisville, are, share a lot of similarities. Louisville, Nashville, Cincinnati, Columbus, uh, Charlotte. Uh, in one sense, uh, the, mayor, the mayor of Louisville doesn't like me to say this, but in one sense, they're, they're all the same. Uh, in terms of sort of general demographics, but they're not the same at all in terms of certain things that are uh, specifically unique to those particular cities. And if you can advance and celebrate those activities and those, those things that are interesting and make them special and use that as a basis over time, uh, you, won't be, you won't be out of date, you won't be passe, you won't be the same as everybody else. So we focused on a number of initiatives in Louisville that did in fact, historically define the city and downtown and continue to define that if we paid attention to it. Uh, the first one was our waterfront. We, as a lot of cities, had moved away from our waterfront. We abandoned it. It was a river city initially. Uh, Scrapyards along the river, highways, the, the usual. We, we had sort of had everything. <laughs> the usual bad things that people did to their waterfronts, we did those all, or, or somebody else did those all in the past in Louisville. Uh, we focused on a very long-term plan to reclaim that waterfront 
Uh, we developed a, uh, a strategy for uh, taking all that property back, making it a waterfront park uh, that had a number of phases. We're in the third phase now, uh, almost 17 years later. That third phase doesn't look exactly like it did the first phase or when, the, when it was first proposed. But in fact, the, the accomplishment of reclaiming our waterfront and making Louisville uh, very well known as a waterfront uh, community uh, has been put in place. Uh, and the waterfront today is a great place for activity and, and people are proud of, of the city and proud of the waterfront that uh, has always been important but was forgotten to some extent in past years. Uh, a second area that we focused on was West Main Street, which is our historic district. It's a great collection of, of cast iron uh, historic buildings. It's a great, vibrant place. It, it, it won one of the Great Cities Awards from APA in 2008. Uh, but it wasn't like that when we started. Uh, it was a historic set piece. Uh, people said, this is our historic district. There was no market for it. There was no celebration of it. There was no interest uh, in, in, or there was no indication that this was something that was important to Louisville. So while we knew that it had potential, we didn't know exactly what that potential was. We realized that if we highlighted that as a unique asset, uh, and celebrated it, it would become a base for lots of interesting creative activities that occurred. So we looked at things that would be, over time, would, would reinforce that base. One of the things that, that uh, it was important in Kentucky, Kentucky had a history of uh, artistic walking sticks, uh, which coming from the Bronx, I didn't know. <laughs> uh, I know that now. So as we were developing a uh, part of our streetscape uh, program, and we needed tree guards, we decided to commission those artists to to develop uh, uh, artistic tree guards in cast iron that would reflect the history of that building uh, or the history of that part of, part of downtown. Uh, the second thing we did was, or a second thing, was do the same thing with uh, what we call our welcome mats. Uh, uh, the, the, the city had a uh, very strong history of what Main Street was, lots of interesting uh, 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 businesses that were river related. Uh, but as, as we all know, sort of the, the uh, fad of, uh, you know, uh, building a building or redeveloping a building and it's, you know, it's called one commerce place or two Galleria Square or three technology center. What does that mean? Uh, well, it doesn't mean anything necessarily in terms of the overall uh, continuum of, of the street or an area, but in fact, it's ba those buildings were based on something that was there before. So we did a very simple thing. We, we created these limestone welcome mats that put back street addresses, which we believed was important. And, and gave all of those buildings, all of those tenants, all of those activities uh, a connection to what was happening. And if one commerce place in 20 years turns into two technology square, that's great, uh, but it's still gonna be 801 West Main Street, which was there because of the, the hat uh, building, the hat business that was there 100 years ago. Uh, and we also, we also thought it was important to not be very uh, concerned about old and the new. Uh, and how those would mix is a lot of historic districts, and, and we do historic preservation projects almost almost uh, hundred uh, percent, so we can say this, I think uh, a lot of historic districts are meant to be or felt to be set pieces where any intrusion is seen as a is a problem. Uh, w West Main Street has always been a very eclectic place, and uh, we thought that was important, so we've blended we blended the new and the old. this is the base of the Yamana building on West Main Street uh, in some cases. The new reflects the old across the street. So we've kept the scale, we've kept the form of that street in terms of an important street, but we've made it, uh, we've made it inviting for people to invest in a whole variety of creative endeavors. And we did use creativity, design, there were a number of design firms there uh, to, to catalyze uh, the redevelopment aspects of Main Street, and the result has been very successful. Lots of new interest, both in uh, public sector and private sector projects. We've tried to, wherever possible, uh, include uh, public art pieces or elements that add to that creativity, but without being too uh, uh, prescriptive about the particular use or the particular activity, and the result has been uh, very dramatic. Uh, the second thing we did was uh, looked at the, the, uh, the assets or the icons of the community as a whole. And uh, we found that Louisville had, uh, which was pretty interesting for uh, a city its size, three icons that were generally known nationally and internationally. Uh, one was the Kentucky Derby, one was uh, the Louisville Slugger, and one was uh, the birthplace and home of Muhammad Ali. Uh, we, have a very, we had, when we started, a very nice 
Derby Museum Visitor Center out by Churchill Downs, uh, which was very busy this past weekend. Uh, and, uh, and that was great, uh, but we didn't uh, have anything that reflected these other two icons. Uh, the Louisville Slugger uh, in the early 90s was actually being made in southern Indiana in an uh, 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 industrial park, so it really should have been called the Clarksville, Indiana Slugger, uh, which nobody really liked to, uh, liked to talk about. So we, we decided to really bring them, uh, to, to make a, an effort to bring them back to, to Louisville, number one, and to put them in the heart of West Main Street, uh, uh, surrounding some of our other visitor centers. And uh, the result has been the, the development of the Slugger Museum and Factory, which again, uh, having a, uh, essentially a wood-burning operation in a historic district, and a 120-foot baseball bat was not necessarily the easiest thing to do in terms of the historic district guidelines. But it was done, and it's been a great success, and people, again, feel proud that this icon of the community is back in Louisville. In fact, there was a parade for the bat when we, uh, when we put it up. And uh, in the interest of letting things sort of happen on their own, uh, what's more appropriate than a plate glass company that's uh, next door to the Slugger Museum to advertise themselves by having a giant baseball go through a piece of plate glass. So it's worked out to be a tremendous uh, asset for the community. Uh, we've built recently the Muhammad Ali Center, which does that as well. Uh, again, an, another indication of what's special about Louisville. Uh, and the result of all this has been not only increased activity in that part of the town, but also uh, lots of other visitor centers and attractions that were, that were, were invested in this street because it, it was a, a street that celebrated the, the, the place of Louisville. Uh, and that's really, that's really the most important thing. Uh, in the past few years, East Main, which is right next to West Main, not surprisingly, has also taken on a character of uh, art galleries and restaurants and sort of creativity as, as, a, uh, as a result of what's happening in West Main. It wasn't planned, but certainly the base that we built was strong enough to enable other things to happen in, in uh, adjacent districts. Uh, what all of this really suggests is that uh, our program was uh, prescriptive, I mean, uh, strategic rather than prescriptive. We didn't say, this is the way we want this project and this is the way we want project. We laid out a number of strategic initiatives and designed uh, uh, efforts, incentives, or strategies to, to encourage development that would carry out these, these uh, strategic initiatives, whatever they, they might be. One of the things that, that Todd mentioned uh, has been the housing fund. We looked at uh, the n amount of downtown, market rate housing downtown, it wasn't very strong. We couldn't quite figure out why initially. Uh, and the, the result we found, not surprisingly, was that people weren't living downtown because there was no place to live downtown, which seems kind of silly, but we, 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 we sort of dr dr uh, drilled down and determined that there were a number of obstacles to the supply side, and we set, and th nothing, nothing that was in place really could uh, deal with that, so we set up a, a new mechanism designed not to develop specific projects per se, but to overcome that particular obstacle. It's a new tool to unleash the private sector to come in and, uh, and work on that particular strategic uh, initiative, and the result has been very successful, and uh, in fact, it has created lots of new housing opportunities downtown. Uh, another thing that was important was to uh, recognize and to celebrate that uh, downtown isn't all one district, that there are different places that are distinct, and the important thing for us was to make sure that they were not competing with, with each other. Uh, uh, when I got to Louisville, uh, there was a, 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 a focus of attention on the southern part of downtown, just about the same time as, as the riverfront work started. And the people who were involved in the southern part said, this is a problem for us. You know, this is going to compete with us. And I'm thinking, this is ridiculous. You know, we really need to look at these things as assets that, that enhance and, and increase the, the, the critical mass downtown. So we focused on looking at the specific, a specific strategy for each district to highlight those districts, to make them, make them each have their own unique uh, character, and then, and then help direct, and not too, not too prescriptively, but at least encourage development in each of these districts that made sense for that particular district. And the most important part is to make sure that we pay attention to the connect connectivity among and between those districts so that if, if one district of downtown is healthy, over time, uh, surrounding districts could also be healthy as a result of it, as, as opposed to being at a disadvantage because of the development that may not have initially gone there. Uh, 
Another important thing deals with metrics. We all, we all uh, uh, focus on metrics. We're all asked, particularly from the public sector, uh, what our metrics are. And uh, some of it is jobs, some of it is tax base, whatever. Uh, but over time, the most significant metric for us was people and activity. If the amount of people downtown is increasing, the, the amount of activity is increasing, uh, then that's a good thing, and that's what you, want to, what you want to encourage. If it's one type of activity versus another, you know, that may be good, may be bad, but in the long run, what you want to do is keep building on, on what has been done previously. And if there's more people on the street uh, than there were the day before, or the year before, the decade before, then you can feel like your downtown is moving in the right direction. Uh, and we certainly had a dramatic increase in activity uh, in terms of downtown, in terms of downtown Louisville. Uh, one other thing I, that I think is important is that while we spend, we've spent, and we can just spend a lot of time on strategic projects, strategic catalytic projects, uh, and those are important if if they're appropriate to do at any given time. Uh, what you always want to do is strengthen your base, uh, even if if economic conditions are not particularly strong. We want to make sure that that we're always adding to the base of, of uh, strength of downtown. The one example I want to use briefly here is uh, Glass, Glassworks is a project that we did, uh, as Todd mentioned, that highlights architectural glass, which was a specialty of the arts industry in Louisville, but nobody really knew about it. So we made that actually one of the, the themes of this new building downtown, and we focused on architectural glass as a strength and as a character of down, uh, characteristic that makes downtown special, that makes Louisville special. And we began to infuse art glass into lots of the public improvements that we did, street lamps and fountains and pedways and those kind of things, so that people began to see that this is something that's interesting and special about downtown. Uh, and, and the reason it's relevant to this situation is because we built, uh, as a policy, we began to build our public parking garage with retail on the ground floor. Uh, in some cases, those, re those retail areas filled up immediately. In most cases, they didn't. They may have, fill, they may have filled up over time. Uh, in some cases, they will never fill up. And uh, the, one of those cases uh, uh, was on First Street in downtown. Uh, we were working with the University of Louisville to develop, actually, an art glass program because of this new focus on arts glass. And uh, they wound up taking that, that retail space. So even though we thought that space would ultimately be used for a different reason, it became, over time, uh, a very active and useful part of our downtown's renaissance and probably uh, had that space been used for a, a small retail shop, it probably wouldn't have been as successful as what we ultimately used it for. And now uh, glass has become part of the marketing uh, activity in downtown. Uh, just a couple of other quick things. One is flexibility. We all, this is sort of preaching to the choir and we can talk about this more in terms of uh, the panel discussion, but we need flexibility in terms of what we, what we do. And we have, we have a fairly open zoning downtown, which is pretty good. Uh, the ability of mixing uses in a particular building has been a problem that we're trying to overcome. The test case we're using is a Hope 6 project just off the, uh, the edge of downtown. Uh, a very ambitious program that over, over 10 years is, is hopefully going to result in about 400 new market rate housing units. Uh, but again, 10 years is a long time. What types of units those would be? How would we mix in the commercial uh, with the residential? It's difficult to know. So we focused initially on a, the, a design form for that particular area of downtown, mixing in public improvements, private improvements, a scale of development that was appropriate, and then began to build projects as the project market uh, presented itself that related to the needs in that particular time. So our first project was actually a student housing pro uh, project, uh, uh, medical student housing, which again, when that plan was developed, uh, there wasn't any sense that there was a need necessarily for that. Turns out there is. Uh, our second and third projects are eight unit, uh, multi, uh, multiple story structures that could be uh, condominiums, could be apartments, could be uh, a mix of those, could be small offices, small businesses, small retail developments. Uh, uh, medical labs, uh, we don't know. And we're building these on eight, eight, eight unit modules at a time so we can, we can accommodate the market uh, as it becomes appropriate. The scale is still appropriate, the uses are still appropriate. We're working through now with the city uh, an attempt to uh, go to performance standards uh, for this area and, and this will be the test case for those types of things. So we can talk about that briefly in a moment. Uh, 
The last uh, item I want to mention really deals with, with quality versus quantity. Uh, more is not often better, not necessarily better. And, uh, you know, if you're looking at a long-term development process, a revitalization process, you have to set a standard of excellence. And this is often difficult for communities to, when somebody comes in and says, I want to do something, and you say, well, it's not really good enough. That's a hard thing to say to mayors and to city councilors and others. But we've, we've done that, and we're proud of the, the standards of excellence we've set in our projects. And we believe that over time, that creates a, a, an expectation that, that will be good for the city in the long run. Uh, and my last comment is that uh, sometimes you have to deal with, or, or it's more appropriate to deal with singles and doubles and home runs. I'm, I'm using my slugger, slugger analogy here, baseball analogy, is that a lot of cities get, get uh, intrigued by large, big developments that uh, are often sold as this is going to solve all of our problems. And uh, in most cases, they don't, even if they come to pass. And even if they do, they tend to be isolated from one another. Uh, our approach has been it's much better to, over time, do a numbers of sing, uh, build a, a, a number of singles and doubles that will drive in the same amount of runs, but you're not dependent upon any particular project. And if some projects fail, which they will, you still have other things that are advocating the or advancing the positions that ultimately lead to a sustainable and healthy downtown. Thank you. Thank you, Barry. We have some time now to have a discussion among the panelists. And I think given the intimate size of the gathering, uh, I'm going to suggest that if you have uh, a question or would like to uh, direct the conversation, feel free to raise your hand and I'll do my best to engage you. Unfortunately, the tyranny of uh, the, the notion of expertise is we have the mics and you don't. Mm -hmm. yeah. I, I, uh, I thought that one of the things that is, uh, has always been vexing with trying to do d development that is going to be flexible, that is going to respond to uh, the age-old uh, system of trial and error. is the regulatory framework. There's also the issue of developers typically seeking predictability. So Barry, from a city perspective, you, you, you said flexibility is key. Um, how do you reconcile the, 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 the need, perceived need for predictability, both from the developer's perspective and from the community's perspective, and the flexibility that allows the, the city and the, the, the economic entities that work within the city to capture uh, opportunities as they arise. All right. Let, let me uh, start with actually the, the, the private sector, because that, that has changed a bit in the last few years, and, and there, are, there are very few good things that have come out of this recession, but I think this is, this is one of them. Uh, five years ago, when we, were when we would propose a mixed-use development project to uh, particularly financing sources. And we, we would say that, you know, we're doing this project and the first four floors will be hotel, two floors will be residential, two floors will be uh, office, and, uh, you know, maybe five floors will be hotel and one will be office. We're not sure. It depends what the market is. The response was not very positive generally. Uh, First of all, they have to fit it in some portfolio category. This is a hotel project, this is a residential project. Different people uh, would, would underwrite those things. So that was, that was one issue. But the second issue really was uh, uh, everyone's looking for certainty. You know? You know, I want to know how many hotel rooms. I want to know how many residential units. And it, it was very challenging. Uh, what's happening now, uh, if you can get credit for a project, and uh, if is underlined, uh, there's much more comfort now in uh, hedging your bets. So when now we go and talk to a financing source and say, you know, we think the hotel market is strong here, uh, but in a couple of years, if that may change, uh, we can always backfill and add another floor of, uh, of uh, housing, or we can develop a floor as housing, and then over time that could change into, into something else. Uh, there's much more comfort now because they've all, uh, well, most of these financing sources have been burned. Uh, 
So I think the flexibility from a private sector side is, is important. It is to us because uh, we don't know what the market's going to be like in three years in a city like Louisville or Buffalo or Pittsburgh. We, we have some ideas, and we all have ideas, but we want to be able to be nimble enough to, do, to, to make those changes. From a public sector side, it's much more difficult. Most of the regulatory agencies you know, want to say, you know, I'm stamping this plan, and this is, this is the plan. Uh, it's gotten easier, actually, this is going to sound somewhat, uh, I'm surprised I'm saying this, but <laughs> it's, it's become easier in suburban projects because you've got form-based codes and, and uh, PEDs and those kind of things which, which sort of advocate uh, uh, flexibility. And while some zoning officials and zoning commissions are still nervous about those, there is some precedent. On individual buildings, so the last building I showed where, you know, it's a 3,800 square foot building and it might be three or four different uses, that's really difficult uh, to do on a building by building basis. In that particular case, uh, we're serving as the master developer. So the, the impact is somewhat similar to a, a, a planned unit development in the suburbs. That's how we're, we're developing it. But it's, gonna, it's going to take uh, uh, examples, successful examples, before communities really buy off on that. And uh, to be perfectly honest, it really needs to be the mayor or the leading public official saying this is this is the way to go. This, this makes sense for our community. We, we've been fortunate in having strong public leadership that has been able to, to carry that on. And David, Bob set down a, 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 an objective with the DRI uh, all those many years ago. And it would appear from the times that I've been to Hale Village Center and you're seeing your overview that there was a good deal of learning as you go. Um, was there a regulatory framework that allowed you that flexibility, or were you dancing around the edges of, uh, of what was permitted? Uh, well, first of all, before he was given any approvals, he had to rewrite the regulatory framework by way of a planned unit development at that time. Uh, which then gave him the ability to do what is normally prohibited historically just about everywhere in the United States, yeah. mixed-use urban form. Um, I think in his case, uh, because he had just spent 17 years thereabouts doing the entire suburban uh, ring around the town center and developed tremendous um, credibility with the citizens and the regulators, uh, he was able to get a great deal accomplished, you know, a great deal of flexibility simply by the power of his credibility. No one would question whether or not what he was about to produce uh, was going to produce a good result. Uh, so his situation is rather unique. Um, what's interesting, though, is today the regulatory framework that's in place for Alachua County, which is the... Um, you know, which regulates most of the development just outside the city of, of Gainesville, it has now adopted a, a regulatory framework that provides a tremendous amount of flexibility so long as you adhere to the fundamental uh, form that is intended, you know, the basic, adhering to the basic principles of traditional town planning essentially. Uh, you do end up with a great deal of flexibility in terms of is use it, and intensity of use. Is it, uh, let me get clear on the language, is it form, is it principles, or both? It's is it form in that it, a form-based code that dictates the size and, and disposition of the structures but doesn't regulate the use, or is it the principles of, uh, of mixed-use, walkable, connected urbanism? Principles of mixed-use, walkable urbanism with tremendous freedom in terms of use and intensity of use uh, permitted within uh, the core uh, of any future development that, that, it, that is going to be a transit-oriented or a traditional neighborhood development. Uh, yeah, that's, that is ideal, and I, I, I hope that that framework is being promulgated nationwide among your, uh, the, the peers. The, I, I, years ago, I had a client who said, yeah, we're going to do a traditional neighborhood development and I said, well, what's the, what's the regulatory environment? So it's no problem. We have a, a traditional neighborhood ordinance. So uh, I took a look at the traditional neighborhood ordinance, and this was in the very early days when um, 
there was a great deal of misunderstanding as to what need what was important uh, the one of the features of this ordinance was that uh, 75 percent and this was in a northern climate in uh, in uh, I think it was New York State it was it was one of the Rust Belt areas and, and one of the one of the uh, criteria was 75 percent of the dwelling units had to have a front porch a covered uh, porch uh, which uh, was not appropriate for this location mm -hmm. it could certainly encourage porches and there were the, the idea that you would have them was a good idea but the in in perpetuity the porches could never be enclosed um, that was one that stuck with me I was talking to somebody the other day who was uh, who is, uh, has some land in, in one of the northern, another Rust Belt state, building a TND or planning to do a TND with an existing new ordinance. And uh, the ordinance uh, ha talks about all the principles, but then says the, uh, the gross density cannot be more than three dwelling units to the acre. Mm -hmm. So he's in the situation of having to do a TND overlay on an existing TND ordinance. Um, which is after all these years after you know it's 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 tough to be have be triumphant of having had uh, this organization uh, active and 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 uh, having had quite a bit of impact uh, over well, the organization two decades the practitioners some of us three decades and still confront things like that um, but it is the the conundrum of of, of being able to have uh, ordinances that protect, protect all the parties uh, and yet have the built-in flexibility. The, uh, at, the, at, the, uh, at the building level, Barry, these buildings that you have here are buildings that learn clearly. Um, they, they can respond to uh, a variety of different uses as, uh, as technology, the economy, demographics uh, allow. How challenging was that to, to, ha to, to have uh, the, these permitted uses? In terms of the, the regulatory environment, it was, as I said, it was a challenge. And uh, we wound up uh, actually writing the, uh, the code for this, this master development uh, with a list of prohibited uses as opposed to a list of uh, allowed uses, which, which made it better, and that took a little bit of, bit of time. But the, the, the issue which was interesting was that uh, there was a lot of discussion about the marketplace, even by, even by sort of the regulatory entities we were working with. Uh, and the city was a partner in this project, so they were, you know, they were, it was a round table, not, we weren't necessarily on other sides of the table, although we were on one part of the round table and they were in another part. Uh, but basically there was a lot of concern about whether the marketplace would be, uh, would find this appropriate in a fairly traditional city like Louisville. And uh, you know, from, from our, our analysis of the marketplace was that this is exactly what they wanted. They wanted, people wanted flexibility, they wanted to know that they can grow in their, their homes, they wanted a different, different style of, of, of community. Uh, uh, this is part of a walkable neighborhood. Uh, so all of the all the, the issues at the end of the day uh, came around or sort of were were, were based on uh, are we are we building a, a fad are we building something that you know looks cool now but in a year or two you know will be completely out of scale or out of character and uh, at the end of the day we we, we found out we did, we did our our sort of test marketing that in fact just the, the characteristics you you mentioned Todd were the things that were most appealing about this that it wasn't it wasn't something that people were kind of stuck in right now. So we, for example, we, we have a, uh, one of these units, uh, we, we uh, sold the unit, sold part of the unit uh, to a couple, and they're interested in opening a business uh, in, the, in the, lower, the lower portion, but a 600 square foot uh, lower unit. Uh, and uh, and their, their response was, we think we're gonna open this business. If it's successful, that's great. If not, uh, it's a place where we can uh, have our, our uh, uh, child, teenager live uh, when he gets a little bit older, you know, or we can rent it out to somebody else. So the flexibility 
of that particular unit and not being limited just to residential flexibility has proven to be a really strong marketing point. We just, those, thing, those units just opened, the two of them have been sold and they're, uh, both of those are, uh, one's a condominium and one's a rental unit and uh, there's a, a small medical uh, bill, uh, office going into one and the second one is, uh, is being leased now or, or being marketed by the owner, not, not by us. Okay, yes, yeah, question. Okay, the, for the, this is being taped, I'm pretty sure. The, the question is the consolidation of the, of the county and the city, the metro government, and what impact that's had. Sure. The, uh, the city and county uh, merged in 2003, uh, and it was the third attempt uh, that was started. The first attempt was in the early, mid-'80s. The second attempt was in the late-'90s, and they both failed closely, and this one passed closely. Uh, I thought it was going to be awful for downtown. I thought the, the focus of the, not just downtown, but the focus on the city uh, was going to be dissipated because of the, uh, the, the, the majority of residents who lived out in the county. Uh, that, that, was, that was sort of was the case for a year or two because the, the, uh, the well, for a variety of political reasons. But over time, actually, that has not been the case, that the, the, the revitalization of downtown has actually been uh, something that, that the community as a whole has taken more pride in, I have to say, than I thought. I'm a fairly cynical person to begin with. Uh, but because, because the advancement of downtown was occurring and was every year it was better than the year before, people began to take advantage of, of downtown. They, they thought of it as part of their community. A couple of things that, that were done that, have, that has had a countywide uh, enthusiasm, the Waterfront Park, Fourth uh, Street Live, which is, which is our retail entertainment district, and most recently the decision to locate the University of Louisville basketball arena downtown instead of out on campus, which was a big fight. Uh, but people, now that it's open to your people, love it. So people come downtown. Uh, so in a sense, our, our market for downtown has increased slightly uh, because of this sort of countywide approach. But generally, uh, I think that would have happened anyway because of the downtown revitalization. So. I'd say generally it's probably been pretty neutral in terms of downtown. Any other questions? Frank. Well, I would say first, there are some prohibited uses, no question about it, uh, by covenants. And there was one exclusive to get the bank in, uh, SunTrust Bank. Um, and then there's the overriding regulatory framework, which limited the amount of office use to a total of 240,000 square feet, and then um, retail at 240,000 square feet. So there was an allocation process that was unfolding as each each uh, 
you know, potential buyer would step forward and say, I want to put a pizza shop in, well, there goes uh, some of uh, the retail, if that's how that's characterized. Um, and what, what is really interesting is it's, it's all sold, 100%, uh, and it, it had to work out where it was half and half, half office, half retail, uh, and those regulations actually are still in place today. And, but there's transition occurring all the time. You know, it's changeover from office to retail and retail back to office because the buildings were um, you know, built in a way that that was relatively easy for most of them. Um, and no one's really keeping track, as best I can tell. So actually, <laughs> the marketplace is actually operating, I think, today, allowing for that mix to adjust over time. Um, the way in which it happened Initially, though, was you know Bob clearly had you know a, a list of uses he wanted to see happen, and would go out and pursue them, and try to convince people to come in and open a flower shop. I, that was one of the things he thought we had to have, and we did for several years. Now, that today is uh, Sisters, a restaurant. Now it's evolved from the flower shop. So originally, it was him recruiting and targeting and cajoling and encouraging, but ultimately, it was all you know, left up to the market and what the market would actually be willing to step forward and buy. And it, was, and it is, I think, entirely local, all people from within the area uh, that bought in. And in the early years, it was sort of hobby retail, I think, is a term that, mm -hmm. that you might yeah. use, Todd. Um, you know, people with a, a lot of time on their hands and not necessarily all that concerned about making money, seemingly. That has transitioned now to pretty hardcore entrepreneurs who want to make money there, and they're doing it. Uh, they're doing very well. That's healthy. Yeah. That's, that's a sign of health. Barry, in, in, is there an, an, an analog in, uh, in Louisville when Cordish came in, for example, did they have to have exclusives on any kinds of, uh, any kinds of users in 4th Street Live? No, they didn't. And, and the, uh, the Cordish thing was sort of an interesting example because uh, uh, we had a, you know, I mentioned sort of the home run projects that we all regretted later, later, later in years. Louisville had one of those in, in the 80s where they pedestrianized the street. They enclosed part of it as an indoor shopping mall. It was just a god-awful project. And uh, uh, when I got there, we were sort of living with the, the dregs of that project. So, uh, uh, one, so, so we, we opened up the street. We blew out the uh, enclosed shopping mall, and we... We, we looked for a, a, a developer to, to, to begin to bring back downtown, particularly entertainment, with, with some retailing. And uh, that's what Cordish did. And, and uh, we, we brought them into town to, to reposition that facility. And uh, uh, there was a lot of controversy about that, about outside developer and you know, chain restaurants and things like that. And uh, we, we understood all those things. Like so, what we see. I, without making any any analogies, uh, and, but but it, what, the thing that was was important for us for that project was to show the local market that you can you can attract people downtown, you can make money downtown, uh, and we were and this is not this is not you know unusual again for mid-sized cities it often takes somebody else to do that. Uh, Corey brought his own critical mass, mm -hmm. uh, which was a good thing. So uh, so we had no. You know, we didn't we didn't uh, work with Corish because we thought a Corish development is the be all and end all. In fact, we didn't, and we still don't. But every year since it's open, it's drawn four million people down to that project, and uh, that has uh, uh, great implications for other other uh, adjoining streets, uh, other local businesses. Uh, some of those national tenants have actually turned into local tenants now. So it, it's taken longer than we thought, but over time. Uh, it'll, it, it's going to be an important project in order to drive some of the more sustainable development uh, downtown, most of which will be which we locally based. So we, there were no exclusives, but there was a lot of controversy about essentially subsidizing uh, a cordage development when other areas of the community were struggling in terms of retail and entertainment. And that was a tough decision by, by the city, uh, but we took it, and, and the result now is uh, very positive in the sense that a lot of the activity that, that has resulted is because of that mass of people that are down there on a regular basis. Uh, we have finished with our allotted time, and the American Institute of Architects wishes me to tell you that this concludes the <laughs> continuing education.
Just in case, as you wander the hallways, you think you're still in the seminar, this is this is proof positive. Uh, but there's nothing following in this in this room. Uh, Joe, you had a question. As long as we're willing to stay. Uh, Yeah, the question is uh, the increment of development, particularly from the city perspective. The, in, in my experience, if I'll take the prerogative of starting the answer to this question, and, and Barry certainly can weigh in, and I know David probably can as well. The, uh, one of the complicating factors in many cities is uh, the parking. That if you have parking requirements, which most cities still do, against all logic, uh, you need a chunk of ground in order to accommodate that. Uh, I, I, we're working in half a dozen cities where it's so logical to take that big block and put it into the slices that built mercantile America before we had to, had to contend with parking automobiles. It, 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 it's such a, a, a beautiful approach. Uh, but uh, unfortunately, where you have on-site parking requirements, you need to be thinking in a big increment. Barry? Well, I think it's a really good question, and uh, but I think I think there's a uh, sort of a, uh, an amendment to it in the sense that uh, there's a difference between uh, big projects and there's a difference between uh, between that and phase projects. And one of the and, and now that I do this on the on the private sector side, this is a, this is sort of a real a real key to our work is that we are hesitant to do a a building in downtown Louisville, Louisville or Buffalo or Paducah, wherever we're operating, uh, when there's lots of development opportunities around it because if we're the pioneer, if we build value, then somebody else will take advantage of that. Or if the city has to, and this was when I was with the city, with the DDC, we would, if we had to acquire more property, it would cost us more money because of the, we, we, we built in our own value and then we're paying for that later on. So, so there is a tendency to sort of look at these things in, in big increments. Uh, it doesn't necessarily mean that it, even if you look at a development uh, area, development district, uh, and you may in fact designate a developer or a certain certain uh, consortium of people to do to develop that property out, uh, it doesn't have to be all done at once. And in fact, we believe that the the most successful projects are not done out done at once. But if you then can tailor the next phase, just like the the Liberty Green project, which is essentially you know, a, a six square block area, we don't control all of it, but we control enough property that we know over a period of time we're going we're gonna, to uh, optimize the value that we created in those early, early projects as opposed to somebody else doing it. But, you know, our, our approach is, and I, I did this when I was with the DDC, and oftentimes, you know, the, the development community didn't like this, is that if somebody came in and said, you know, I can, I can get financing for 200 housing units downtown, you know, and we're going to do this, this, uh, for you know, three or four buildings, uh, my response would be, that's great. Do 100 units, do 50 mm -hmm. units first. Let's see how that works, and then we'll adjust the next 50 units based on the market, and hopefully the market will be stronger. Uh, it's, it's, hard, it's hard sometimes for the development community to understand that's certainly a challenge to, to, to tell that to the, to the mayor. Uh, but I think, I think our, our answer to that would be if you, if you focused on multiple phase projects, regardless of who might have control of those things, then you're less likely to get into that situation or, or less likely to be, be stuck with a project that was overly ambitious or, yeah. in fact, may, the market may have changed by the time you got to that. I would argue project. with you, though, Barry, about, about the concern that you're making somebody else rich. If you deal pencils and you're helping enhance other pieces of ground that perhaps you don't own, you're still enhancing the whole, which in a good in a good urban environment is going to is going to enhance your asset as well. I mean, ideally right, right. to capture, right. you know, the return on aggravation, uh, you want to hit as much I as think possible. The, 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 the phrase that was important there is if the deal pencils. You know? Yeah. Yeah. We're oh still, yeah. Absolutely. We're still in a situation in downtown Louisville where most projects, except the very smallest, need some type of public assistance, mm -hmm. public partnership, mm -hmm. and 
you know, my goal is, and, I, and, and certain projects, if they met those guidelines and criteria, are worth supporting. Uh, but what I don't want to do is to support a project and then have to support the next project to a greater degree, if that greater degree is going to a property owner who didn't do anything with this property. Right, in the first right, place. right, right. So different, diff the, the, depending on the robustness of the market, that may be true, it may not be true. Oh, they do. They do. Uh, the, the, I think the I think the parking is. No. Do the silver bullet. Yeah. One thing, you know, before I walked in here, I, I, I bumped into Robert Davis and, and showed him that time-lapse photo of Tupelo Street and, and told him we were talking about time. He said, Site Belgravia, where the Duke of whatever uh, hired the production builders of the time uh, to build these beautiful terraces in, in Belgravia in London. But it was on leased land, 99-year lease, which most of London is, and a good deal of Manhattan is as well, um, where the, 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 uh, much of the appreciation, the long-term appreciation, went to the, the, uh, the controlling entity. Now, obviously, the entity has to have a long time horizon when you're talking about 99-year leases, but perhaps from the perspective of time, that's the way we should be thinking. And he said, you know, for new construction, Maybe unleased land uh, would be a problem in America, uh, but in the current and projected future environment, maybe it's an idea that has this time has come around again. So I'll leave you with with that thought. And we from, and just to the problem, yeah. we we never sell our land downtown. We always do it on long term leases, just for among other reasons that that control issue. Well, I suspect the AIA would approve if I would suggest that even if you have one master developer, if you can have multiple architects doing the separate phases, it might help. Absolutely. <laughs> I can remember walking around the seaside during one of those tours that we would give, and uh, somebody who was new to TNDs was walking alongside of me and said, who's the, who's the best architect for, for housing in one of these environments? And I said, oh, well, you know, most of us think that the best environments are, are designed by many hands. And he said, well, where are they based? <laughs> <laughs> Thank you very much for, uh, for being a, a small but dedicated and tenacious audience. <laughs>